Good morning. Welcome to VBank Back Tech Talk. My name is Anthony Chow. I am a software developer. I write firmware for networking equipment. I'm passionate with security and cloud technology. Today, let's look at what is uh, VxLAN in a contemporary data center. So what is a contemporary data center? What I see is that in a contemporary data center, virtualized virtualization technology is being used. There is server virtualization, and then comes storage virtualization, and some network virtualization. With the virtualization, virtual machines is able to move from one machine to another machine, which makes the data center very dynamic and agile. With that, if, and also when multiple VMs running on top of a physical machine, the demand for the network is increasing. And this is why we need to catch up. And for a long time, network virtualization has not been able to catch up so fast. Not until last year, the IT industry is getting more and more um, products try to alleviate this problem. Okay, when we look at the, the tech magazines, we often see these terms, SDN, uh, NFV, and network virtualization. So what do they all mean? Um, Today, we're going to take a look at some of these before we go into VXLAN, because I think this concept is very important So before we go on. Um, one thing I need to point out is that IT vendor is very fast to claim that they have SDN solution. I have an uncle, he works in IBM. One time, they changed the product name from something to with, with the name with a cloud, and sales just took off. That is without any product feature change. Just a name change. And I think SDN is having a similar phenomenon with this, is that whatever product you have, you will have an SDN, the, the, will, the sales will just go up. Um, and also, uh, because I have a 10 minute limitation, we, I cannot go into too deep of all these concepts, because by itself, these things can be a tech talk by itself. So first of all, we look at the SDN, Software Defined Networking. This is a heavily used um, term in all, and recently, if you look at magazines, uh, if you look at uh, people talk about, they, they, they always talk about software-defined networking. So what is software-defined networking? I think this is similar to Xerox machine. People call it copy machine Xerox machine because Xerox actually is a company. SDN is also having a similar uh, I will not say problem, but similar uh, in category, is that SDN itself is a framework. So in the traditional networking equipment, there is the data plane and there's the control plane. The control plane is to, to learn the routes and to populate the routes. And the for, uh, data plane is the forwarding element of it. They all, put, they all uh, happen in the same chassis or same box. With SDN, the concept is that it is a separation of the data and the control plane. And most likely, the control plane is on a centralized location. And you can see if from the slide, a, there are a few commercial SDN controllers. There is um, uh, Cisco, there's HP, Neoarch Network, and there's also Cisco. They all claim to have an SDN controller. But if you look at uh, uh, VMware, NSX, and Cisco, they're all very different, even though they call themselves SDN controller. The next thing is network function virtualization. And this, usually, people talk about uh, F NFV uh, related to SDN. Well, what is the NFV? It's a network service or network uh, function. These are the layer 4 and the layer 7 services that we have put in the network. What it does, or the example of a layer 4 or layer 7 service will be the uh, familiar firewall, load balancer, um, or even DNS caching. So with this, the, the concept of NFV is that we make it as a virtual machine. So why this SDN and NFV is always closely related? One important element is that um, with, with uh, NFV being a virtual machine, we can use the SDN flow control to force the packet into the, the, the network services. And then this is something called um, service chaining. So even though NFN and SDN do not have to be together or, uh, or deployed together, they, when they are used together, it becomes a very powerful tool. 
So when we talk about network virtualization, SDN and FFV, so what, are, what about this term network virtualization? Is network virtualization also a kind of network virtualization? The statement seems to be revolving around for itself. Actually, when usually when we talk about network virtualization, it means something uh, we do to logical, uh, providing a logical isolation on a physical network. This concept is, also, is not new at all. Uh, in the layer two, we have the VLAN. In 1995, I've been working with uh, VLAN technologies. And even today, well, this is being deployed in lots of um, uh, IT, sh IT shops. In layer three, we have the v VRF, a virtual routing and forwarding. And I do believe uh, Cisco has the virtual device context, which is also, and we can look at that in the, in the Nexus 5K and 7K, that we can always look at um, uh, as a form of logical isolation. Recently, we have the, the network overlay. Network overlay is not a new concept either. Well, a service provider has been using um, MPLS in the, in the deployment for network overlays. But for enterprise, network overlay technology is starting to be used as a form of network virtualization. Basically, for, for uh, network overlay, it is the, the, the exist, uh, forming of two endpoints to form a, a channel. Just like if you think of the channel as a uh, virtual cable between two Ethernet ports. And most of the time, the, um, the overlay is, in f in, is running on top of the, an I existing IP structure. This is one advantage of this is one advantage of having network virtualization is that you, there is an existing IP infrastructure and we do not have to make any wiring changes. The network is already there. If you look at the data sheet of the VMware NSX, they will claim as long as you have a reliable network, uh, layer three network, NSX will just run. Uh, these are com say, uh, some common form of network overlays as we can see. Uh, VXLAN, of course, this is the tech talk topic of today. And we have the NVGRE. This is being used by Microsoft um, Hyper-V. And there is also STT. This is a proprietary protocol used by VMware. And the last one we see is the network virtualization overlay. I'm not sure if Cisco is using that. Seems like you, Cisco is moving toward VXLAN also. When we look at one technology, I think the best part is to look at some of the terminology. This is the best way to learn. If you look at this picture, this picture not only uh, lit, uh, details the different fields, but also with color coding, it explains the whole concept of encapsulation. Because for network overlay, encapsulation is the key. What we are trying to do is to encapsulate a layer two frame on top an, uh, of an IP frame uh, with a UDP header, so that we are shipped from one from the source destination to the to the to the, to the, des to the destination destination. So this is the uh, encapsulation is some key concept that we have to know. Another uh, terminology what we have is VTAP, the virtual land tunnel endpoint. VNI is the VXLAN network identifier, and also there's a VTAP gateway. VNI is an identifier that will uniquely identify a logical segment in VXLAN. And this is important. This is basically, if this is a 24-bit field, field that along with v VLAN ID, we can have up to 60 million logical segments, well, theoretically, with a logical segment in a network. VTAP is very, very important. We, before we talk about encapsulation, VTAP, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a term, it's a VXLAN termination tunnel endpoint. This is where the encapsulation and also decapsulation is being done. The packets are being uh, encapsulated from one VTAP and sent to the destination VTAP, and then it's being decaps decapsulated. We'll put it back into original form, uh, the original layer two packet, and then the destination will see that. And if you can see from this, uh, from this slide, we have um, the v, uh, VXLAN ID 1010 and 1020. They, these in, uh, I, I like the, the color coding because this is also a very nice way to, 
to, to, to show how a tunnel is being formed from one end to another. So we have VTAP. Why do we need a VTAP gateway? In the data center, we don't necessarily virtualize everything. Some machine may be still sitting at a physical network. So what we have is that we need a VTAP gateway to do the translation. If you look at the top part of the picture, we have a mapping of a VLAN ID to a VXLAN ID, and this is how the VTAP gateway will be able to uh, translate or being uh, act as a proxy for um, for for the virtual for the traffic on the virtualized network to the physical network. IP multicast. Well, RFC uh, 7348 defines VXLAN. It specifically says that says that uh, stated that IP multicast it will be used for VXLAN. Uh, IP multicast is not a uh, new concept. Uh, what it does is uh, machines will join the multicast group, and only members of the same multicast group will get the um, get the get the packet. Well, of course, uh, multicast is not a good thing to be in the in the um, in the network, it, but uh, it is necessary for VXLAN to operate. Um, I uh, we will touch on this later on when we go to our RFC. But IP multicast is being utilized. In this picture, we have VXLAN address learning. As I said before, uh, IP multicast is not very, uh, I mean, multicast traffic in the network is not, not good because it takes up lots of bandwidth. Uh, VXLAN address learning is important so that we will know, oh, for this virtual machine, is uh, associated with this VTAP. So next time when there is traffic directly toward a specific VM, we, will, we don't need to use IP multicast. From here, we have on the left side of the picture, we have a uh, host with a VTAP IP of 10, 20, 10 10.10, with a VM with MAC1. Let's say if MAC1 wants to talk to MAC2 on the other side of the, of the network, it will send out a ARP broadcast packet. With that, the VTAP 10.20.10.10 will send out the IP multicast to the other side, or to the multicast group. Uh, in this case, we only have two members in the same multicast group. So host two will receive the packet. Once it receives the packet, it will do the learning. This learning part is just similar to the Ethernet switch source learning. We will learn, oh, for this Mac, we are, see, we are seeing this in this VTAP. So when the Mac 2 reply on, with an uh, up reply is a unicast packet, it will, when it reaches the VTAP 10.20.10.11, uh, it will know that we need to send, send the packet directly back to VTAP 10.20.10.10, and there is no multicast necessary. RFC 7348 defines VXLAN. Uh, v, uh, RFC stands for Request for Comment. It is very important. Uh, years ago, I worked for a small startup company. There was an interoperability, interoperability issue with Cisco. What we've done is that we pull out the RFC, we verify that we did exactly what RFC says. And for that, we, when we show it to Cisco, Cisco has to change. And we can see the importance of an RFC. This is the authoritative uh, document for a specific feature. Uh, the title of RFC 7348 is called the VXLAN, a framework for overlaying virtualized layer 2 network over a layer 3 network. In this RFC, it points out three specific problems that uh, VXLAN is trying to solve. Limitation posed by spanning tree in VLAN ranges, multi-tenant environment, or, and also inadequate site data both sides in the tall switches. In the data center, most of the time we run it on a flat, data, uh, flat layer 2 network. Spanning tree is necessary to prevent loops so that there will not be any broadcast storm. This is necessary for a layer 2 flat network. But this also poses a lim limitation. Some ports are being blocked. We cannot use multipathing. Uh, and also for the uh, 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 rate return of investment is also not good because not all my ports that I invest is being utilized at one time. The other limitation of VLAN ranges is that VLAN ID is a 12-bit uh, field. Uh, VLAN 0 and VLAN 4095 is reserved. So we only have 4,094 VLANs on a, available on a flat network, and this is limit, limited because that leads to another point is the multi-tenant. In a virtualized environment or a cloud environment, uh, the, the multi-tenancy is also a must. And also, we need to provide um, 
isolation between these tenants. Let's say if Coca-Cola and Pepsi are on the same cloud, we for sure we do not want the traffic to be able to mix. Uh, there will be uh, not a very good consequence if we have a leakage on that. So, but for multi-tenancy, because of the r uh, limitation of VLAN ranges, we will not be able to host that many tenants in a flat network. This is one problem that VLAN is, uh, VXLAN is trying to resolve. The other, other, other thing is that on the uh, usually for VXLAN there is a tall switch. And because virtual machine, is, virtual machine is running on a physical network, we, the MAC address table tends to uh, run out and it is not very, uh, the data center cannot scale too well. Uh, on this last slide, I have summarized the, what is being set in the RFC. Basically, it just states how VXLAN operates. And I would like to look at the last three, last three points, which is use of data plane learning. Multicast is used for carry, carrying unknown destination broadcasts and multicast traffic, and also VTAP must not fragment uh, VXLAN packet, because I think these three points has a significant, uh, significant effect on how it operates on the data center. Well, what does he mean by use of data plane, data plane learning? There is, that means there is no control plane. Learning is just like, as I have mentioned before, in the VTAP learning, it's just similar to the source learning of your Ethernet switch, and there is no control plane. But however, uh, maybe it's also related to the next point is the multicast. Multicast is being specifically spelled out in the RFC, so for VTAP to operate, we must use multicast. But of course, multicast traffic is not very nice in a big network. So what some vendors, such as v, um, uh, VMware, NSX, and Cisco, they have some prior, uh, Cisco, uh, the, the next uh, 10, uh, I think the version number is uh, 1KV. They have some proprietary solution so that uh, uh, multicast does not have to be used. Because uh, for v v uh, VMware, for example, when a VM is spin up, it registers itself to the NSX controller. So the controller knows whereabout of all the virtu virtual machines, and there's no need for multicast. And that will limit a lot of multicast traffic onto a network, which is a big plus. The, the last thing is that the, the we have to point out is the VTAP must not fragment. This has significant impact on the underneath uh, network, although on the physical underlay, we don't need to do rewiring. We do need some configuration because the standard default size of an Ethernet network, network is 1500. With encapsulation, this is no more true. Uh, VMware recommend the default si MTU size is 1600 or to use jumbo frame. With, but that it has to be enabled end to end. So this has implication on the underlay network. And this is very important because in the RFC is specifically stated, well, for here I have highlighted must not in, uh, in red, but in, in the actual RFC, what you look at is that the must not is in bold. So it is a very important element. So I hope we have look at VXLAN in the, in the contemporary data center. And this is what I have. Thank you for the